Welcome to a special episode of The Health Bridge. We are actually on the set of the Urban Monk TV show here with my good friend, Dr. Tom O'Brien. Doc, welcome. Thank you. Thank nice you so much. Yeah. So today's the day. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. I really want to get into this gluten thing. Uh, it's all over the press. Uh, you know, John Oliver is making jokes about it. It's funny, except it isn't, right? And so I really want to peel back on gluten and get a better understanding for our listeners because it is uh, a challenge to know what the right answer is, and you're, you've got a lot of research going for you. So uh, first, how did you get into understanding this? Like you got into this uh, in an interesting fashion, and now you're the expert at it. So how did you end up in the gluten universe? 34 year, 35 years ago, my wife and I couldn't get pregnant. I, I was in my internship at the time. I called the seven most famous doctors I'd ever heard of, and I asked, well, what would you do for infertility? They all told me what they'd do, and I wrote it all down, and I put a program together. We were pregnant in six weeks. My neighbors in married housing had been through artificial insemination, and nothing had worked. They asked if I'd work with them, and I said, well, I don't really know what I'm doing, you know, but I don't think it'll hurt you. She was pregnant in three months. So we were hot to trot coming out of our internship and ready to go out and heal the world and help everybody get pregnant that wanted to get pregnant, right? <laughs> and there's a checklist of things that you look for with hormone imbalances. Uh, um, and at the top of the list, consistently, I can't say every time, but consistently, food sensitivities are at the top of the list. Almost for everyone that has hormone irregularities. And the most common food was gluten that people were sensitive to. Now back in the late 70s, there weren't very good tests available, so it was really by trial and error. Let's take this out for a few weeks and see how you feel. Now we've got much more science and much more um, uh, ability to accurately identify this. But, so that got me into it, and it was 15 years ago that I read a research article in the journal Neurology of 10 patients who had been on workman's compensation for an average of eight years because of migraines. They couldn't work for eight years. And somehow in reading that paper, I thought about, what about the kids in that family? What's it like to live in a house like that where there's so much stress because dad can't work and they're living off of their uh, savings and uh, shh, 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 dad's got a headache. And it just hit me. And the paper talked about all 10 of these people, when they checked, had a gluten sensitivity, not celiac disease, a gluten sensitivity. When they took gluten out of the diet, seven out of 10 had complete relief, two out of 10 got partial relief, and the 10th one refused the diet. So that just shocked me. And you saw the, the x-rays, uh, uh, the MRIs of these people in the research article showed they had lesions in their brain from the gluten. Now I know that you can reverse lesions in the brain sometimes on a gluten-free diet. There are many studies on this now. Oh, let's back up real quick and say what is gluten? Just, just in yeah. case, I want to get everyone on the right page here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, gluten is not bad for you. Premise number one, gluten is not bad for you. Bad gluten is bad for you. That gluten is the term for a family of proteins and, that fa and it's in most grains. There's gluten in wheat, rye, and barley. Those are the toxic ones. There's gluten in corn, rice, amaranth, quinoa. So gluten's not bad for you. Unfortunately, the term gluten sensitivity is now in our language, and so we associate the word gluten as being bad. It's not. Now, somebody can be sensitive to rice. That's really possible and uh, fairly common, but that's not... Um, the type of gluten we're talking about here. We're talking about wheat, rye, and barley. So it's a protein, it's a family of proteins in wheat, rye, and barley. Now, what's just come out this year, in 2015, the papers from Harvard have come out that show they took three different groups of people. They took celiac patients, that's when gluten sensitivity is chewing away your gut, it's eating away at you. They took people that did not have celiac disease but had a sensitivity to wheat, and they took people that did not have a problem with wheat, three different groups. And they looked at four different types of wheat. They looked at two modern strains, the hybrid strains of wheat, and two ancient strains of wheat. This is for all you people that think it's okay to eat ancient strains of wheat if you have a sensitivity 
It's not. But, so they looked at all four types of, of wheat, all three groups, and what did they find? Every type of wheat stimulated the genes for intestinal permeability, the slang term is leaky gut, in all three groups. Every human, every time we are exposed to wheat, rye or barley, every human develops intestinal permeability every time. Wow. Yeah, yeah, every time. The, the, the science is very clear now. This is not a fad. This is not some doctor trying to make a name for themselves. There are many, many research papers on this now. Every human, every time. So some people feel it, some people get sick from it, and some people don't. So right. what really separates us in that, in that spectrum? It's called loss of oral tolerance. There's a threshold. And whether you're two years old, 20 years old, 65 years old, somewhere you cross an imaginary line and you can't put up with this insult anymore. And it's the straw that broke the camel's back. Now you start getting pathogenic intestinal permeability. So I'm gonna back up a little to give this view. Your intestines are a tube. It's about 20, 25 feet long from the mouth to the other end. The inside of the tube is lined with shag carpeting. This shag is where calcium is absorbed, this shag vitamin C, this shag fish oils, other shags, the amino acids from proteins, all the shags absorb different nutrients. Celiac disease is when your shags wear down and you've got Berber. Hmm. If you have Berber, you don't absorb calcium. You get osteoporosis. You know, it's not rocket science. Hmm. That's why in the archives of internal medicine, they say that every osteoporotic patient needs to be checked for celiac disease, as celiac disease could be the cause of their osteoporosis. They're not saying every osteoporotic patient has it, but they're saying it's so very common that you just have to check. Hmm. Have you heard before that um, women, with the most dangerous group with osteoporosis, um, osteoporosis is a leading cause of death in women over 60, right? It's the complications from a fracture of the hip. And within one year, they often pass because they form a clot. So osteoporosis is very serious. Have you heard that the, the drugs that are used for osteoporosis are called bisphosphonates? That's the family of drugs. And your doctor has been shown, the pharmaceutical rep comes in to visit the doc at lunch. You know, he gets a lunch appointment, so they have an opportunity to talk to the doctor. And so they bring lunch in for the staff and lunch for the doctor, and they bring this research article, and they start talking about what the doc's eating, and he's looking at this article that the pharmaceutical rep has brought in on the drug he's talking about, and he's highlighted a couple of points, and so the doc's looking at it, oh, okay. And turn the page, doc, you turn the page, and you see, yes, the bisphosphonates make more bone. And you see the pictures of the x-rays before and after. Uh, before they take the drug and after they take the drug, and the x-rays look better. They, uh, clearly, you have more bone. No question about that. But what the uh, pharmaceutical rep doesn't tell the doctor is that the bone you make is balsa wood. It's not oak. <laughs> it's balsa wood. And so it still breaks. So women that take bisphosphonates have almost identical rates of fractures as women that don't take bisphosphonates in osteoporosis. Awesome. <laughs> because you, if you're not absorbing your calcium and vitamin D and vitamin K, you don't have the building blocks. So the drugs help build the architecture, the scaffolding for new bone, but it doesn't get filled in with all the bricks and the mortar, mm. right? So you got balsa wood, so you break bones just as easily. And so people who've worn down their intestinal villi or the carpet shags right. down to Berber right. can't absorb. They don't absorb. And then they become osteoporotic. Right. And then the solution for that is a drug that makes it look better but doesn't actually make the bone any stronger. Exactly. And so we have all these people with brittle bones. Exactly. And so how do, you, how do we screen for this? Because I know a lot of people say, I went to the doctor and they said I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, there was one more concept on the bone thing, if yeah. I could just yeah, stay yeah, there absolutely. for a minute. And that's why the archives of internal medicine say every osteoporotic patient just needs to be checked. It's not that they've all got it. You just need to check. And you have to check accurately. So your test, your, your question is really relevant. Many, many people have friends who have gotten a check for gluten sensitivity. Yeah, I went to my doctor, he checked me for sick, and I'm, I'm fine, I don't have celiac disease. But I feel better if I don't eat wheat. The doctor said, oh, it's all in your head. It's okay, see, here's the test results. So I'd like to talk about testing for a minute. Yeah. There's two types of tests that, or two things to test for 
when you're looking at this condition. One is celiac disease, the other is gluten sensitivity, and they're different. Celiac disease is when a gluten sensitivity affects your gut and it wears down the shags. You don't have to have celiac disease to have a problem with gluten. For every one person that has symptoms in their gut, there are eight people that don't. It's somewhere else. It's in the most common area is the brain, or it could be the kidneys or the lungs or any other tissue in the body. So the ratio is one out of eight. So the first test is for celiac disease. That test looks at something called transglutaminase. That's the blood test that doctors do to confirm if you have celiac disease. And all of the research papers show the blood test is 97%, 99%, 100% accurate for identifying celiac disease. Well, how do they know that? Because the researchers in validating the test, they went back and they bought the blood of 100 celiac patients. Because there's blood banks that have blood of people with diseases, so researchers can get lots of blood of people with lupus or MS to see if their drugs or tests work. So they bought the blood of people with celiac disease to see, and the transglutaminase test is right on the money every time. Every time. The problem is the blood samples. The blood samples are from people that have celiac disease. In order to have celiac disease, the diagnosis, your shags have to be worn down completely. It's called total villus atrophy. So it's the end stage of the disease. The earlier stage, which can be there for years causing problems, the shags may be just a little bit worn down. Or you might just, might just have the inflammation before the shags get worn down. And you can have lots of problems with that. You don't have to have the shags completely worn down. But when you look at people on the whole spectrum of the celiac spectrum, the blood test transglutaminase is 27 to 33 percent accurate. It mm. comes back with false negatives seven out of ten times. Wow. And so those people get a blood test, they're told they're fine. See, there's no problem here. But they stop eating wheat and they feel better. And the doctor tells them it's all in your head. Mm. And they're confused. They don't know. Well, this is the reason why, because your doctor doesn't know that the test or the research articles that say the test is right on the money, that they used people with celiac disease as the samples to check. All the time, yeah. And so it's cherry picking the data. Mm. It wasn't their intent to be misleading because they just look for people with celiac, but you don't get the diagnosis unless your shags are completely worn down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now... So that's the first test. Yeah. There, there was a two, two tests, if I may. Yeah, of course. Uh, the second test, so for transglutaminase, if it comes back positive, you got a problem. But if it comes back negative, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a problem. It's not sensitive to the earlier stages, which can be just as bad, just as devastating. You get seizures, you get attention deficit, you can get autism, you can get chest pain, you can get muscle pains uh, with earlier stages of celiac disease. It doesn't have to be at the end stage. So if it comes back positive, you got the problem, but it's not comprehensive for the earlier stages. The second test is looking for the sensitivity to gluten itself, not looking to see if the shags are worn down. So is your body fighting this food to say, you got a problem with this food? Now, if you think of gluten um, as a pearl necklace, that the protein is like a pearl necklace, hydrochloric acid undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you got a string of pearls. And our enzymes are supposed to act like scissors to cut off each pearl of the pearl necklace, right? Mm -hmm. The problem with gluten proteins in wheat, rye, and barley, we don't have the enzymes to cut it down into each individual amino acid. The best we can do is break it into clumps of pearls. A 17 pearl clump, a 33 pearl clump, a 19 pearl clump. All these different clumps of pearls are called peptides. And the problem is those peptides trigger the inflammation in your intestines. So the blood test to look for that, every laboratory in the country looks at a 33 pearl clump called alpha glidin. And 50% of celiacs will have alpha glidin elevated, but the other 50% don't. Mm. And you say, but wait a minute, celiac disease, if you know they're a celiac, celiac disease is a reaction to gluten, but the gluten test is coming back negative. Well, I guess the gluten test is not very good. No. That's just one of the peptides. There are many peptides, there are over 50 that have been identified as triggering the immune system to fight the food. There's over 50 of these peptides, but every laboratory in the country just tests one. 
They don't test the others. Why? No one has an answer as to why. A laboratory opened four years ago that looks at the top 10 peptides of gluten, and you don't get the false negatives anymore. So in terms of testing, we have to know those two things. One, transglutaminase, it comes back positive, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. If it comes back negative, it doesn't mean that you don't have the problem, it means we don't know. And then gluten, if you do alpha gliadin and it comes back positive, you got a problem mm -hmm. with gluten. But if it comes back negative, it doesn't mean you don't. Mm -hmm. The test from the lab is called Cyrex, Cyrex Lab, C-Y-R-E-X, CyrexLabs.com. If that test comes back positive, you got a problem. If it comes back negative, you likely don't. You likely don't. You still could because there are others, but you likely don't. They've looked at the top 10 out of these 50 and basically said statistically chances are these are the ones that are going to be the ones that create a reaction with your immune system. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. So you've gone through this whole arc and you have people that have it all worn down that are totally sick and not doing well or are getting osteoporotic and people that have sensitivities and just know that they feel better when they're not eating grains. And yet the Harvard study is saying everyone has been affected. Uh, everyone, everyone gets affected. Everyone reacts. Now whether your system can calm it down, you see, so we've got these shags, right? The shags are covered with cheesecloth so that only really small molecules can get through. So when the scissors break down the pearl necklace, those little pearls called amino acids can go right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream and your body uses them to make new muscle and bone and all of that. So the cheesecloth controls, so you've got this tube from the mouth to the other end, it's lined with cheesecloth, so only really small molecules can get through into the bloodstream. What happens when you're exposed to gluten is that you tear the cheesecloth. But the fastest growing cells in the body are the inside lining of the intestines. Every three to seven days, we have a whole new lining to our intestines. It's like the skin of a snake, right? Just kind of shedding it right off. So you tear the cheesecloth, but it heals uh, after the toasted breakfast. You have a sandwich for lunch. You tear the cheesecloth, but it heals. You have pasta for dinner. You tear the cheesecloth, but it heals. A cookie, you tear the cheesecloth, but it heals. Croutons on your salad, tear the cheesecloth, but it heals. Day in, day out, day in and day out. But the most popular food that we eat in our culture today, which is wheat-based products, day in, day out, day in, day out, until one day you cross that imaginary threshold, you don't heal anymore. It's called a loss of oral tolerance. Oral meaning what we eat, tolerance, that we can tolerate this little insult, we heal from it. But when you have a loss of oral tolerance, you don't heal anymore. Mm. Now you have tears in the cheesecloth. That's called pathogenic intestinal permeability. The slang term is the leaky gut. Mm -hmm. Now you get these bigger molecules getting through the tears in the cheesecloth before there's been enough time for those molecules to be broken down into the smaller pieces. Mm. Those bigger molecules are called macromolecules, big molecules. So it gets into your bloodstream. So here comes a tomato. And before it's broken down completely, a clump of the tomato gets into the bloodstream. Your immune system says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. I better fight this. You make antibodies to tomatoes. Your body's protecting you from this macromolecule that got in there that's not supposed to get in. And then beef, and then chicken, and then, and then spices, and then bananas. And uh, these are people that do a 90 food panel and it comes back and it shows they're allergic to 25 or 30 foods. And the people say, that's, oh my God, that's all that I eat. Well, of course it's what you eat because your immune system's doing what it's supposed to to protect you. You don't want to shut down the immune system. You want to heal the leaky gut. That's the critical component here. And when you do that, six months to a year later, when you do that 90 food panel again, now you're sensitive to one or two foods and those are true allergies. So when you develop an allergy, because people have been told this, is once you develop an allergy and you have antibodies to say, like tomatoes, you're always going to have problems with tomatoes that, you know, for the rest of your life because the body has now registered that as an allergy or a sensitivity. But you're saying that if it hasn't gone too far and you, back, and you clear the leaky gut, you're really not going to get those big macro tomato clumps in there and then the immune system backs off? When people get a vaccination, like for measles, you get a shot of the bug measles. Your brain says, whoa, what's this? This is not good for me. And your immune system, you have an Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, um, Navy, um, IgA, IgG, IgM, IgE, 
Um, they're, they're branches of the immune system that are there to protect you. Your brain says, you, general, in, in the Air Force maybe, general, and he's sitting around with nothing to do, you fight this, get rid of this. Now you have general tomato. And General Tomato builds an assembly line. The assembly line starts producing soldiers that are trained to go after these tomato macromolecules in your bloodstream. Those soldiers are called antibodies. And they're going around in the bloodstream, they fire a chemical bullet called cytokines, and they're just trying to destroy the tomatoes. And that's all they do is destroy tomatoes. When all the tomatoes are gone, the tomato molecules are gone, General Tomato, who's watching this, says, okay, turn off the assembly line, we don't need those soldiers anymore. So if I were to check you right now, you shouldn't have antibodies to measles in your bloodstream, mm. but unless you've been exposed. But general measles or general tomato is now vigilant the rest of his life. The rest of his life. If measles ever gets into your body again, then general measles who's watching this says, oh, he just has to flip the switch. He doesn't have to build the assembly line again that takes months. He just has to flip the switch. That's why if you go to Africa, you need vaccinations for yellow fever, dengue fever, all these strange diseases, months and months ahead of time. But if you go back to visit 15 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go. Everybody knows about booster shots. Mm -hmm. but all you have to do is wake up general yellow fever. Mm -hmm. General yellow fever is called a memory B cell. Memory B cells, their job is to keep the memory that this is not good. Now, as far as I know, the only food that we have identified memory B cells to, as far as I know, is gluten. There are no memory B cells to tomatoes. Interesting. So that we know gluten, if you have elevated antibodies to gluten, it's lifelong. You can't reverse that. People say, well, I can reverse it. Some doctors saying I can reverse it. Well, show me that you shut down the memory B cells. They don't do that. What, what they're able to do with their protocols is get rid of the symptoms you had when you were exposed to gluten, which is helpful, but people are misled because you're still tearing the cheesecloth and you have these antibodies in there. We don't know about memory B cells to eggs or to chicken or to any other food, just gluten. So that's the one food that we know is permanent. That's great news. Yeah. It's like a gateway drug <laughs> to the rest of it. <laughs> exactly. So that you probably can eat some, some or most of those foods again, but you just have to check. How you feel is not a measure of whether the food is okay for you or not. It's critical that you feel good when you eat a food or you don't feel bad, but you can't use that as the determining factor if the food is okay. Because the damage, see, you pull at a chain, the, break, the, the chain breaks at the weakest link. It could be at one end, the middle, the other end, your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever your genetic weak link is. So if your weak link is in your brain, like it was for me, and you are exposed to uh, gluten. You may not feel bad in your tummy when you eat it, but you may get elevated antibodies to your brain tissue and it's killing off your brain cells. And over the years, it gets more and more damage. Nobody gets Alzheimer's in their 60s or 70s. You get Alzheimer's in your 20s and 30s. Mm. It just, it's a decades long process of killing off brain cells. Mm. Just last November, um, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who runs the Alzheimer's Research Center at UCLA. He published the first paper showing reversing Alzheimer's in 10 patients over three years. He reversed Alzheimer's. And what did he do? He got rid of all the inflammation. Hmm. Food sensitivities were a critical component of that. There were more, but it was just get rid of the inflammation, calm down the fire. You don't feel fire in the brain. You don't feel it, unless you're lucky enough to get headaches or migraines or uh, attention deficit or something, then you have symptoms which is the alert to do something, but most times you don't feel it. I had elevated antibodies to three different tissues in my brain. Myelin, basic protein, which causes MS. Cerebellar peptides, which is why old people can't walk with grace anymore, and they're really cautious, is because their cerebellum has been attacked for many, many years. And gangliosides, which causes numbness and tingling. I had all three. I looked at this, I said, what? This is a mistake, because I was a triathlete. You know, this is about 12 years ago. I was a triathlete in the peak of my life. And I called the lab and said, this is a mistake. No, it's not. Do it again. We did. We know it's you. We did it again. It's accurate. And it was a wake-up call for me because I didn't have any symptoms at all. 
Can you explain the difference between, say, this uh, myelin sensitivity and, say, the memory B cell? Because now we're talking about autoimmunity, which is something that's, that's a whole different game coming from this gluten issue, isn't it? That's, that's the big kahuna. That's actually the problem. The problem is not gluten causes sore tummies or something like that. The problem, the number, we've always thought that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death and that cancer is number two. And we know that autoimmune diseases are number three. Now they're looked at separately, you know, they're in separate silos, like a farm has silos to store the corn. The silos of medicine that um, if you have MS, you go to a neurologist. If you have uh, psoriasis, you go to a dermatologist. If you have rheumatoid, you go to a rheumatologist. And they focus on your symptoms. But the mechanisms that cause all of this are the same. The same basic mechanisms, there's a trilogy in the development of autoimmune diseases. First is the genetic vulnerability to the disease. Second is an environmental trigger that sets it off, the straw that broke the camel's back. And third is intestinal permeability, the leaky gut. Mm. And papers started coming out 10 years ago that said you can arrest, and that's their language, arrest the development of autoimmune disease by healing the gut. Mm. And doctors went, what, what? Yes, you can arrest rheumatoid by healing the gut. And we've done it so many times. So the focus, the takeaway focus to this talk today for you and I is your gut is primary. Irrespective of what symptoms you have, you want to put attention on your gut, mm. right? So how do you get this intestinal permeability, the leaky gut? You tear the cheesecloth. And when you cross that imaginary line and it doesn't heal anymore, that's when you get pathogenic intestinal permeability. The big molecules go into the bloodstream and that starts the whole cascade. Wherever the weak link is in your chain is, that's where you'll have your symptoms. So, grandma never had these problems. I never heard about this stuff. Why is it that now, you know, this is what I hear all the time. It's like, you know, it never used to be this way. Why all of a sudden, we've been eating bread for 10,000 years, why all of a sudden is this an issue? Yeah. Yeah, really good question. There's two studies that I'll talk to on that. One's from Mayo, Mayo Clinic, and they found 9,734, I think it was, samples of blood from airmen from the 1950s. What a gold mine. If you're a researcher, to find blood that's been frozen and still good from 60 years ago, to compare People back then with people today, what a gold mine. You can't argue when you've actually got the blood because you can test it. We have better equipment now for testing, right? So they looked at these 9,000 plus blood samples of mostly men, there weren't many women in the Air Force, and they checked to see how many of them had silent celiac disease, which means their shags were worn down, and so transglutaminase would be positive. Their shags were worn down, but they didn't have any symptoms that they knew about that were associated with. They may have headaches, but they didn't know that could have been there from what they were eating. What did they find? <coughs> Excuse me. And then they compared with 9,000 men from Humboldt County, Minnesota, which is where Mayo is, uh, same age bracket who came in for physicals. They were healthy and they just came in for physicals. In the 1950s no, or the, uh, present uh, day? Uh, 2009. Got it. 2009. So 9,000 guys from the 1950s and 9,000 guys from today. Mm -hmm. And they looked at the same blood markers and they looked to see how many of these people have celiac disease and didn't know it. They found that the guys today, there's a four-fold increase in the number of people that have the disease today than had it in the 1950s. Mm. Four times more, not 50% more, not 100% more, not two times more, four times more than 60 years ago. And they followed these guys from the Air Force from the 1950s because they were veterans so they could follow their health history because they go to the VA for their services throughout their life. How long did they live? What did they die from? And we know the projections of someone diagnosed today in their 20s, how long will they live and what will they die from? And they found that the expected lifespan is also shorter for the people, the men today than it was in the 1960s. It's 3.86 fold shorter lifespan than the guys back in the 1950s. So more people are getting it today and they're dying earlier. Well. Now that's consistent, when there's one more study I'll tell you about, but that's consistent 
New England Journal of Medicine article that you're familiar with that came out nine years ago that said for the first time in the history of human civilization, for the very first time, our children have a shorter projected lifespan than their parents. Mm. For the first time in history of human, humanity, your kids are going to get sick earlier, get diseases earlier, and die earlier than you. That means our healthcare system isn't working, mm -hmm. right? And so this study from the Air Force Base in the 1950s and Mayo Clinic today is consistent with that study. Here's a second st study on why more now. In Brazil, they looked at children diagnosed with, how many children they did, I, I don't know how many, I think it was four or 500, I'm not sure, in the number of people, and they did blood tests on how many kids have celiac disease and they looked at elders, their grandparents, and how many of the same numbers of grandparents have celiac disease. And so they compared them, and what did they find? There was a 5.3 fold increased number of kids today that are getting it than the old people that have it. Hmm. Five times more kids have it than the old people. So it's, it's just ramping up, it's ramping up. So the question is why? Yeah, so it is a thing, it is happening, it's not in our heads. Right, it's getting worse. It's not in your head, it's getting worse. It's not a fad, it's getting worse. Here's why. It's called loss of oral tolerance. That when we go to a picnic and we eat the potato salad, how come four people get sick out of the 20 that ate it? Mm. And, uh, but, and all 20 people don't get sick. Well, it's because those four people, the strength of the immune system in their gut can't handle the bacteria because the potato salad was left out too long in the sun, mm -hmm. right? So more bacteria grew in there and their immune systems are vulnerable. They don't have tolerance. You, um, everyone else's immune system is, oh, this is a bad bug. Oh, let's just deal with it. Let's get the bug out of here. And your immune system in the gut can deal with it. Mm -hmm. But for those people that got sick, they can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. So it's loss of oral tolerance. And the loss of oral tolerance is occurring earlier and earlier in humanity today because of all of the stuff we're exposed to, all of the toxins we're exposed to. You think fish is good for you, but what about the mercury? Mm -hmm. You think that rice is good for you, but what about the arsenic? Mm -hmm. You know, the, we're, we're exposed to so many toxins in what we thought to be good foods that it builds up and builds up and our builds up in our system and we lose tolerance that our immune system is fighting so hard it's hyper vigilant and it becomes anxious like it's got anxiety and just the littlest thing comes no nope, got to fight that and the result is what we could tolerate before we can no longer tolerate hmm. sounds like a metaphor for all of life really That's right. yeah i mean we're crazy we're life push, we live. yeah we're pushed to the brink and it seems like the chemical exposure is adding to that. So then what the answer would obviously be if you're sensitive to the stuff, back off. If you're not sensitive to the stuff, back off and build some tolerance, build some resilience. So is there a way to create a cushion, to build up the vitality, to do something to help us offset this and maybe heal the gut? You bet. You bet there is. And for all of our viewers here today, the message is really clear. Heal your gut. Start learning about how to identify if there's any issues in my gut. I don't mean stomach pain. I mean the microbiome, the good bacteria that's there. Um, you know, we have 10 times more cells of the good bacteria in our intestines than all the cells in our body put together, all the muscle cells, skin cells, bone cells. You add them all up, there's 10 times more cells of bacteria in our gut. And that bacteria has 150 to 200 times more genes than the human genome. And genes control function. We now know, without doubt, there's no question, your gut controls brain function. Your gut determines how much of the nerve hormones called neurotransmitters that your brain makes. That's controlled by the bacteria in the gut. They send the messages to say, make more serotonin, make more dopamine. All of these neurotransmitters that are critical to how we feel, whether we're happy or depressed, anxious or schizophrenic, that those neurotransmitters are produced by messages that come from the bacteria in the gut. Mm -hmm. So that when you have abnormal environment in the gut, you get mixed messages going up to the brain. And so your brain function is altered from it. So, and that, that whole world is called enteric neuroscience. And people are getting their PhDs now in enteric neuroscience. Mm -hmm. 
There's papers coming out all the time. And if you're a physician and you look at all the seminars that are coming out, there are seminars every month now for doctors to go to or to listen to online about the value of working on the microbiome in the gut. So for our listeners here and our viewers at home, the key is learn everything you can over time. Don't be fanatical on this, but you just put a little bit of attention regularly on healing your gut. One of the uh, recommendations I give to all of our patients is every day, every day, you have a forkful of fermented vegetables, just a forkful. Doesn't matter which ones, sauerkraut, kimchi, Whole Foods sells 10 different types that you can get, like curry flavored or caraway seed flavored. But get, have a little fermented vegetables because they help encourage the good bacteria in the gut. That's just one little thing that you can do. Now, going to the store and buying a bottle of probiotics, the good bacteria, and taking it one capsule a day is not gonna get the job done. And that's what we thought back in the 1970s and the 1980s, and it's helpful. And there's no reason why not to, but that's not a complete approach. The foods that we eat, the more organic the foods, the better. You know, they're spraying GM, uh, they're spraying the GMO chemical called glyphosate. They spray it on the wheat now in our country three weeks before they harvest. Why? It kills the wheat. And then it doesn't plug up the combine machines. So all of the wheat, if it's not organic now, has residue of glyphosate on it. And so that's your breads and your cookies and all of that, and if they're not organic. And glyphosate causes intestinal permeability. You tear the cheesecloth. So that's another insult. Besides the wheat itself and the pearl necklace clumps of uh, uh, peptides, now just the chemical that comes along for the ride with the wheat, glyphosate causes intestinal permeability. When you have a three-year-old or a five-year-old that's having trouble, and you say, well, this kid didn't even, you know, didn't even have a chance to mess things up, that's when we got to start looking at the bacteria that came through mom and dad and just kind of the genetic lineage. I'd love for you to speak to that a bit. Oh, you bet, you bet. Uh, in Sweden, they have socialized medicine. They have records on everybody. When a child is born, they poke the baby's finger, they put a drop of blood on a card. <sighs> they dry the card and they store it. They've got 50 million cards. They've been doing this since the 1960s, right? They looked at people currently diagnosed with schizophrenia. So they're in their 30s or 40s. And they went back and they looked at the card from their birth. What did they find when they looked at the card? They, they looked at that drop of blood on the card for antibodies to gluten. Now the, the gliden antibodies that we talked about earlier. They looked for antibodies to gluten. Now babies don't make antibodies at birth. That uh, the antibodies that baby has in their bloodstream when they're born come from mom. Mm. Why? In the eighth month of pregnancy, mom starts sending antibodies down to baby, to the fetus, say, okay, baby, here's some antibodies to cats. We have cats at home. They're nice cats. You don't have to freak out. Here's some antibodies so you don't freak out. Or we live in the woods and the, tr the leaves fall down and the leaves decay, there's mold in the air. Here's some antibodies to the mold around our home. Mm. So baby is being prepped for the world that baby's about to come out into. And what world is that? Mom's world. Mm. It's a perfect system. You know, if we didn't have this, we wouldn't be here today. Mm. So baby comes out with some immunity to the bugs in the air and the bacteria and stuff. You know, cats carry lots of bugs and uh, um, uh, baby is prepped and prepared. So they looked at that drop of blood to uh, uh, babies at birth to see, did they have elevated antibodies to gluten. What did they find? Those babies with the top 10% of antibodies to gluten had a 70% increased likelihood of developing schizophrenia 30 to 40 years later. Those babies in the top 5% of antibodies to gluten had a 240% increased risk of developing schizophrenia 30 to 40 years later. Wow. So I show that slide in my presentations to doctors and they sit there and they say, wow, some of them are like deer in the headlights. You know, I didn't know that. Wow. What do I do with that? Here's what you do with it. Every woman of childbearing age is just checked to see 
do they have elevated antibodies to gluten before they get pregnant, especially the women that have a family history of any type of cognitive complaints or mental disorders in the family, especially them, because this is genetic. And so if, if the woman has elevated antibodies to gluten, you just explain to her. Now here's a study that just came out. Nobody knows why this happens, but this is shocking. So to help your baby have the best shot possible, let's guide you in having a nutrient-dense, really rich diet, great nutrients and vitamins so your body's good and strong and your brain and nervous system is strong. So if and when you get pregnant, you and your husband are ready to get pregnant, your body is ready to go to create the best environment for baby. That's the way to use these kinds of studies, right? Is to see, you're at high risk, here's how you reduce the risk. The challenge today is I saw gluten in shampoo the other day. I yeah. mean, gluten is everywhere. So even if you're trying to behave at the restaurant, um, you might have some issues. Uh, and you mentioned a couple studies that I'd love for you to talk about. Um, and also just the amount of products that we're putting this stuff in. And I don't even know why. I mean, it's a good binding agent, I guess. Yeah, it is. It's a binding agent. Gluten means glue. And so it stretches but doesn't break. So that means your bread can rise higher, your cookies and muffins can be lighter and all of that. Yeah, uh, they've got gluten, they put gluten in dental retainers. So your kids that are wearing retainers, they've got gluten in them. There's gluten in vitamins, there's gluten in your drugs, you have to ask the pharmacist, is this gluten free? Well, I don't know, find out. And they'll, they'll check for you, they may not want to, but if you ask, they will, they'll find out. So it's in your spices. McDonald's puts gluten in their French fries. I mean, it, um, we, we were at J. Alexander's last week. It's a chain restaurant. And I'm gonna put this on film, I'm saying this here, because we ordered um, gluten-free foods and I, my sister ordered a piece of fish grilled with a little bit of olive oil and some rice. And I said, you know, ask the chef if there's any uh, gluten in this meal anywhere. Then the waiter said, no, no, there's no, but yeah, I understand, but just ask him anyway. And he came and said, oh, uh, apparently we put flour in our rice. I didn't know that. All of our rice dishes have flour in it. Hmm. So it's hidden. You'd never know you're getting the exposure. Three of the last seven Japanese restaurants I've gone to, I've asked the same question, and the waitress comes back and says, yes, the chef puts a scoop of flour in the sushi rice. So you can't naively think that uh, foods that don't look like they have gluten are safe. That you have to ask, you have to inquire, you have to learn how to ask the right questions. The um, FDA just published a study in early 2015, just um, I think it was January of 2015, three of their scientists, they looked at 275 different foods, gluten-free foods. They put them in two categories. One category was labeled gluten-free, the other category was naturally gluten-free, but not labeled, like rice cakes. And you read the label, it's rice and salt, right? Uh, but it's not labeled on the outside, gluten-free. And so they looked at these two categories of gluten-free foods. What did they find when they were searching for gluten? The foods that were labeled gluten-free, gluten 97.3% -free, of them were actually gluten-free. But just under 3% had toxic levels of gluten. So that's a pretty good uh, uh, ratio for the industry, but it's not good if you're one of the people. Not if you're in those 2.7. You're right. in that 2.7, right. Yeah. And in the foods that were naturally gluten-free, 24.7% of them had toxic levels of gluten. 24.7%. One out of four times when you eat quinoa, or you eat amaranth cookies, or you eat um, granola bars, that have no gluten in, on the label, but they're not labeled gluten-free, one out of four times, you're getting toxic levels of gluten. And here's the problem with that, is that a single exposure, you activate the memory B cell, general gluten, he turns on the assembly line, starts producing the soldiers, and that whole inflammatory cascade goes for at least three months, and for some as long as six months. Wow. From one exposure, from one exposure. It's overwhelming when you start thinking about this. I've been working for years to come up with a solution to that. And there are some enzymes and things that help with that. Exactly. Um.
Go ahead. Yeah. Um, there was a point that I didn't carry forward. I'd like to carry forward now, and that is about autoimmunity. Yeah. Because I talked about heart disease and cancer and that autoimmunity is number three. That's accepted. It's number three cause of getting sick and dying. However, papers started coming out 10 years ago that show atherosclerosis, hardening of your arteries, is an autoimmune process. Hmm. So what becomes the number one mechanism in getting sick and dying in the world? It's your immune system attacking self, autoimmunity. That's why this is so critically important for you and your family to understand just the basics of this. It's going to take some time to study. You'll listen to this interview again and again, and then you'll start searching for more information. Uh, it's critical that you get this, that the autoimmune mechanism is the number one cause of getting sick and dying in the world. The number one. And, so, and where does it come from? Genetic vulnerability, environmental trigger, intestinal permeability. Mm -hmm. So you have to correct the tears in the cheesecloth. To protect your family, you and your family, you have to prevent the tearing of the cheesecloth. And you have to create the environment in the microbiome so that it's strong enough to deal with the insult and to heal. That's primary. Uh, it sounds like there's no other way around this but through it. That's right, that's exactly right. Is that, that's why I train physicians on this all over the world. We have over 450 doctors now that are certified gluten practitioners. And they know this. They know how to test for it. They know how to treat it. They know the education process that people have to go through. It takes six months, sometimes a year, to really get it down so that you're on track. You know? You're going to blow it sometimes. That happens. But you learn from the experience so that it, if it takes you a year to really get this down, now you and your family are gluten-free and you're vibrant, healthy, and those headaches are gone, the attention deficits calm down. The teacher said the new drugs you're using are really working with your son. And you say, I didn't give him any drugs. I just put him on a diet. Mm. And the teacher say, I've heard that before, right? <laughs> that happens fairly regularly for people because the kids' brains start working better. Let, let me tell you about that study. Yeah. In the Journal of Attention Disorders, they looked at 132 kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. They put them on a strict gluten-free diet. Within six months, every child or the parents reported improvement in all 12 DSM-4 markers for attention deficit. Doesn't pay attention, fails to finish work, blurts out answers, interrupts frequently, can't sit still. All 12 markers improved in every child within six months. Wow. And the teachers say the new drugs you give are working, right? Because they don't know. They don't know. Now, if that were a drug, it'd be on the front page of every paper in the country. Yeah. But there's no profit in this. So there's no one that's the, the messenger trying to carry this out to everybody. Yeah. Uh, there was a little bit of a diamond in the rough there when you had mentioned these statistics when you said close to 97% of the labeled foods were actually what they said they were versus the non. So it seems like if we had a little bit more emphasis on food companies actually going and labeling and certifying that things are gluten-free and having a, being a little more meticulous, that would at least help carve into that 24% to almost 25% of foods that are just burning this. That's exactly right. That is a really good strategic approach to take is to write letters to the companies, to Kellogg and General Mills and all of those companies. Mm -hmm. If they get uh, 10,000 letters, they start to listen. They start to say, oh, we might need to look into this a little deeper. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. It's funny, is uh, just you know, yesterday, the day before this recording, um, a very big Swiss uh, company that's a, that's a grocery chain started to ban glyphosate. Why? Because the consumer said, hey, get this out of our food. So it is happening. The tide is turning. Things are starting to work. Uh, but it's from information like this and conversations like this that people then go, hey, wait a minute. And then they go start writing companies and doing things and changing things around their lives. I saw a video uh, uh, from Sweden, and it was uh, someone like you and the Urban Monk um, who did this video of a family of four, a family of four who went organic. And they went organic for three weeks. And all the food was given to them to be organic for three weeks. And they measured the amount of toxic chemicals in their urine before they started. And then they measured it um, throughout the three-week period. And by the end, uh, at the beginning, you were shocked to see that the boy, little boy and the girl and the, and the mom and dad all had very high levels of these toxic chemicals that cause cancer, um, cause many other degenerative diseases. We all have this, by the way. 
But here, here was the measurement, and you give them organic food for three weeks, and it just went right down to almost zero, almost zero, That's within three weeks. And that came out of Sweden, so it's that kind of information, kind of that um, general public, hey, listen to this, and then the public says, whoa, we demand, I want more organic, mm -hmm. or in this case, I want no GMO, mm -hmm. uh, which is what we need to do in this country. Yeah, and it all starts with some examples, uh, but don't wait uh, to be on the other side of history. I think the moral of the story here is you've heard what Dr. O'Brien had to say. It's time to really start taking a close look at what you're eating and pulling the gluten out to see how you feel and understand that if you have been exposed, three to six months might need to go by before a lot of this stuff starts to clear. But you feel better quickly. Uh, usually within three days to a week, you feel better on a gluten-free diet. Most people do, but the immune system will not calm down that quickly. Right. So that's one thing I'd like to share as a personal story is I could eat bread and feel fine. But then a couple days later, I find that all my orthopedic issues are worse. My, my joints are achy. The hip that I hurt hurts more. And, you know, I didn't put two and two together for years. And then as I cut out the gluten, it became so clear, clear as day. Within a day or two, all of a sudden, whatever it was, much better. Yeah. Back in the day when I was doing marathons, I used to run a lot of marathons, right? And, and um, I'd eat a pint of haagen three or four times a week, mm. right? But only honey vanilla, because there's no sugar. That's kind of the silly logic I use. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I noticed that, you know, I had chest pains every once in a while. And I said, where is this coming from? Because I have a family history of heart disease, so I was concerned. So I went and I, I had um, lots of exams and scored off the charts on their treadmills. And, and um, the MRIs, the 64 slice MRIs were all normal. Everything was great. No, you're fine. I said, I, I get this chest pain. Well, it must be in your head, mm -hmm. right? And they actually told me that. And then I realized, and one day I was on vacation or something, and I came back and I had haagen -Dazs. And the next day I had my chest pain, and I associated to, no, that can't be. That's not it. And so I just kept eating. And said, but then here's the chest pain that would just keep coming. And then when I stopped the ice cream, the chest pain was gone. So, and same thing with gluten. You know, uh, for some people it's dairy, for some it's gluten. But the symptoms that you just live with, you think, well, I'm healthy, but dot, dot, dot. And when you get the gluten out of your diet, the dot, dot, dot goes away. Fantastic. Doc, how do people find you? The dr.com. The doctor, dr.com. Dr. Tom O'Brien, you are a gentleman and a scholar. Great to have you here. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. See you next time. <laughs>